But we, we are just excited. Can you feel it in the air? What a good God we serve. What great stuff he's doing. What great stuff he's doing. I want you to think for a moment about what he's done in your life. At Connect Group last Thursday, I'm sitting there and we start sharing testimonies. And, you know, I felt like I had to pick my jaw up because people started sharing about what God was doing in their life. We have one lady in our Connect Group who, um, while she was pregnant, um, the doctors told her that the the baby had a problem with its spine and that the fluid in its brain was not draining and that the, the baby would be bo born severely handicapped. Um, so she came to us and we said, gosh, we just refuse that. God can heal a spine, can heal whatever needs to be healed. We prayed for her. Um, she went away. They went back to the doctors and they said, oh, we must have made a mistake. But nonetheless, the baby doesn't have that anymore. But the baby uh, does have Down syndrome. So she had to go for blood tests and the various things. So now she came back to us and said, oh, my gosh, it just keeps getting worse. So we said, well, if God did one thing, he can do another thing. So we prayed again. And um, a couple of weeks back, the baby was born. And church, I've seen the pictures. When she gets back, she's back home with her mom right now. But when she gets back, she's going to stand up here with this baby. There is absolutely nothing wrong with the child. I mean... How, how is this God of ours? So how is this God of ours? Another lady, she's sitting there and she's telling us how a friend of hers couldn't fall pregnant. And so she went for tests and they discovered she had something severely wrong with her thyroid. Um, any doctors in the house are going to have to help me with this. But I believe it was, it was overactive and the only way to cure it was to actually give radiation therapy. And it's a very, very severe thing that could re result in um, just terrible consequences for her life. Um, and friends again prayed. And she went back to the doctor. I know, I know, I know, Desh, you are, you're a doctor here, but I think this is a common phrase for doctors um, when Christians are around. They, she, they got the new tests and they said, oh, we can't explain it. We must have made a mistake, but there's nothing wrong with your thyroid. So I'm just absolutely delighted. Sorry that I don't know all the medical terms. I'm just trying to remember my Bible. It's just enough for me. <laughs> But nonetheless, I, I just feel like God is, is doing such great things. I want you to think back about your family. You know, when I, when I got born again, none of my family was saved. And I remember praying and asking God, please could all my family get saved? And as I prayed it in my heart, I knew it was impossible. You know, I was like, I'm just praying this because it's the right thing to pray. But, you know, I just I can't imagine it ever happening. And at this point, every single one of my family are serving the Lord. All my nieces, all my nephews, everyone. Sometimes I feel like the least Christian person in our gatherings. You know, they're just, they're just absolutely amazing. And I, I just, I want you to think back about who you were before you met the Lord and what God has done in your life. This is the God we serve. Nothing is impossible. He takes the broken and makes it whole. He takes the weak and makes it strong. He takes the foolish and makes it wise. He just infuses all of our lives with something that transforms it to a place of joy and life and expansion and prosperity. And I, as I begin this uh, sermon, I want us to start from that place. I want us to remember who God is and what he's done. At the same time, we look around our lives and we have to acknowledge when we look at society, something's wrong. I know you probably all know someone with a marriage on the rocks. I know it's not yours. But we all know families where the children are um, you know, not serving the Lord and are in self-destructive behavior. You know, we, we've had great news this weekend. It's just I, I hardly believed half the things I was hearing. But, um, you know, very often when you listen to the news, it's just list after list after list of bad thing happening. But there is a solution. And I want us 
to not necessarily look at the bad things, keep our eyes on Jesus and the incredible God that we have, but at the same time acknowledge that the goodness and the grace that he is pouring out in our lives cannot stop with our lives. That there is a world out there that needs the glory and the grace that is on your life. There is a world out there that needs to hear the message that you carry. There's a world out there that needs to know the goodness of Jesus. And some of you might say, gosh, that calamity you talk about out there, it's in my life. But I'm here to say you don't have to live with it. The message is that Jesus came to do away with that stuff, to give you the kind of victories that you've always dreamed of. Go after them, grab them, and once you have them, start spreading the news to the people around you. Because God wants his world back. God wants his glory over all of the earth. So you see these signs we have up all over, and you might wonder, what does it mean? Just one, take the risk. We are launching a three-year campaign. Why three years? Because we think that's a good time. Three is just a biblical number, and we feel like, gosh, if we do it for three years, we'll really get it. But we're launching a three-year campaign in which we, we are trusting that every one of you will identify one person, and you will bring them into the kingdom, and you will walk with them until they are serving God. Once you've done your one, you and that one person are going to turn around and find another just one. Because sometimes we look at the huge problem ahead of us and we say, oh my word, how do we transform the government? How do we reform the education system? How do we help all the families? And it seems overwhelming, but I'm here to tell you it's not overwhelming because God is asking you for just one. Do the one thing in front of you that you can do. And when you have done that, turn and do the next one thing in front of you and do that. And as we all do it, we will stand amazed at the glory of God flooding our nation. Amen. I'm absolutely convinced that South Africa is meant to bring the light of reformation to this continent. I'm absolutely convinced that we're standing on the brink of a move of God in Africa that is going to make the world stand to attention. And I am absolutely convinced that we are part of that move. Amen. And this is how we do it. We see what's in front of us. We do it. And when we finish doing it, we turn and we do the next thing and we just keep going. Amen. Amen. So, we are calling it Just One, Take the Risk, and we are going to be looking at Acts 9, 10 to 22 today. So Lord, I just pray that as we share around the word, that you would come and flood us with revelation of who you are. Flood us with revelation of what you are doing. Flood us with revelation of how we can be a part of this, Lord God. Father God, I ask that not one of us would be left out of this great thing that you are doing, Lord. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. So before I read the story, I need to just give you some background. Many of you know the story. It's a very famous story. But there was a man in Israel. His Jewish name was Saul. His Greek name was Paul. Most likely he was the pride of his parents because they were of the tribe of Benjamin and they, na- Benjamin and they named him Saul, which means they thought he was going to be a king of some, co- some kind. He was a fervent Israelite, defending the Jewish faith to the best of his ability, trained by the most famous teachers in Israel. In his zeal to preserve the the Jewish culture, the Jewish way of life, the Jewish religion. He participated in the destruction or the persecution of this growing sect in Israel 2,000 years ago. The sect which they called the way or Christianity had begun amongst the the kind of like less wealthy working class of Israel. And 
it had mainly been like fishermen, working class people from the north of, of Israel who were not considered such, uh, such prominent citizens. So at first, everyone was kind of willing to just look past it. But suddenly, priests, educated people, Greek Jews who were like the merchants and the, the wealthy people of Israel started being a part of this Christianity. And Saul was getting angry because they were undermining everything he'd given his faith for, his life for. And the story goes that he, he had gone to the high priest and he'd gotten letters and he had... Um, uh, found ways of getting the authority to go into the different towns where the Christians had been scattered and to start arresting them and bringing them to trial. He'd overseen the, the death of one of their members. And it's clear that his intention was to oversee the death of many more. And as he's on his way out of Jerusalem with the letter from the high priest heading towards another town called Damascus, you know the story. This bright light comes down from heaven and stops, in his, stops him in his tracks. And right there, Jesus appears to him and says, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? He says, who on earth are you? And Jesus says, I'm Jesus. And Saul has this conversion where he suddenly realizes the fulfillment of all his Jewishness is to be found in Jesus. Because of the bright light, and I don't know, there might have been something more to it, but he is blind and he is led by his companions into Damascus. And there he's just, can you imagine that? I mean, he's blind, he's had this encounter, his entire world's been turned upside down. He realizes everything he believed about the way the world works was wrong. I mean, he's, he's sitting there. The Bible says he's busy praying, but I can imagine he's crying out to God and saying, God, I, I, what is true? How does this work? Show me what's going on. I'm, I'm floundering. I don't know which way's up and which way's down. I don't, know, I don't know if I'll ever see again, and I don't understand the world anymore. And we open the story there. From... Verse 10, in Damascus, there was a disciple named Ananias. The Lord called him in, in a vision, Ananias. Yes, Lord, he answered. The Lord told him, go to the house of Judas on Straight Street and ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul, for he is praying. In a vision, he has seen a man named Ananias come and place his hands on him to restore his sight. Lord, Ananias answered, I have heard many reports about this man and the harm he has done to, our, to your saints in Jerusalem. And he has come here with authority from the chief priest to arrest all who call on your name. But the Lord said to Ananias, go, this man is my chosen instrument to carry my name before the Gentiles and their kings and before the people of Israel. I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. Then I, Ananias went to the house and entered it. Placing his hands on Saul, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road as you were coming here has sent me to you, has sent me so that you may see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately something like scales fell from Saul's eyes and he could see again. He got up and was baptized and after taking some food, he regained his strength. Saul spent several days with the disciples in Damascus. At once he began to preach in the synagogues that Jesus is the Son of God. All those who heard him were astonished and asked, isn't he the man who raised havoc in Jerusalem, Jerusalem among those who call on his name? And hasn't, sorry, who call on this name, and hasn't he come here to take them as prisoners to the chief priests? Yet Saul grew more and more powerful and baffled the Jews living in Damascus by proving that Jesus is the Christ. I want to start with two phrases. 
it starts with a disciple named a disciple named Ananias. And when Ananias gets the instruction to go lay hands on Saul, he says this, I have heard many reports. I I want my first point to be that the cross was a complete victory. Just because I want to preach it, I don't even know if it fits into this passage. No, it does. <laughs> but I want you to put yourself in Ananias' shoes for a moment. The Bible doesn't say that he was one of the leaders. The Bible doesn't say he had any special gifts. In fact, there's only one reference to him sometime later, but really he appears to be just one of the everyday followers of Jesus. And so very easily you could put your name in there. All of us could put our names in there. He wasn't an apostle. He hadn't done mighty works before this time. He was just going about his business trying to be the best follower of Jesus that he could be. And then he has this vision and Jesus asks him to go and minister to someone that he knows has been causing havoc amongst the church. I want you to picture that for a moment, what that must have felt like him, for him. You must remember, this wasn't like a man saying bad things in the press about the church. This wasn't someone just saying, let's all go and pray to another God. This, this was a man who was actively trying to kill Christians. And this is the, the sad part about it, is that he had the sanction of the authorities. Ananias was part of the church that had been scattered in persecution. So after Stephen was uh, martyred, the church scattered to different towns because they were afraid of the persecution in Jerusalem. They wanted to live. I suspect that Ananias was battling with a feeling of God, I'm serving you. I saw Jesus resurrected. I'm doing what he says. And yet, men, women, and children that I love are dying in the most gruesome ways. That we are being persecuted. We've had to leave our homes. We, we face financial ruin. We face death on every day. Lord, I feel, I feel that your victory just is not, a, is not coming to my life. And you know, I, I asked God, I said to him, I said, Lord, what stops us from actually doing what's in our heart to reach out to the lost around you? I bet you, if I said, if you were guaranteed of success, that if you spoke to your neighbor about Jesus, that they would, they would say, yes, I want to receive him, would you do it? So I said, God, why don't we do it? And as clear as anything I feel like, he said, my people feel oppressed by the devil. Our people feel under siege by evil. They feel like they're on the losing end. They're looking at the world. They see negative things around them. They're experiencing negative things. And they feel like, oh my word, I'm just a poor little fish in a big sea. And gosh, there's so much going on. And I bet you, you felt like that from time to time. You've noticed the difficulties in your life. Things haven't gone the way you expected. The victories you expected to come didn't come. And it's so tempting. It's so tempting to retreat into this little keep myself safe place. And what we've done in that moment is we've forgotten that the cross was a complete victory. It's like the devil comes to blind us from this enormous truth. Guys, I, some of us have not even grasped it in the first place. So we haven't even got it. So if you never got it, get it today. If you got it but lost it, recapture it. Here's the way I look at it. Here's the way I look at it. Is that our sin, our rebellion, our disobedience, our ignorance... 
opened up the way for the devil to come and mess with us. Now, really, you think back way back when. It opened, the, it put us under the lordship of the devil, basically. It moved our allegiance to him. He became an authority in our lives, and he began to mess with us, to bring bad things. Th think about your family and, the, and things that have happened there. Jesus seeing what was happening came to this earth, and he said to the devil, you have a right to steal, kill, and destroy these people because they have given that right to you. But I'm offering you a trade. I'm going to say this to you. Take me instead. Take me instead. And when he hung on the cross, he talked about how the prince of this world was coming. What was he saying? He was saying, guys, I'm t I am standing in every one of your places. And every consequence that you deserve, I am going to take it. Of course, the devil was delighted. <laughs> I mean, he knew Jesus was God. He was like, I have him now. If I can just get authority over Jesus, I will have the whole world. And he threw all his rage, hatred, vehemence, cruelty at Jesus. He threw every broken marriage, every destroyed life, every ungodly thing, every broken society. He threw it at Jesus in a moment. Dragged him down to the depths of hell and said, I've got you now. The good part of the story. I feel like I need a drum roll and a trumpet right now because we know what happened. Is that the devil, devil couldn't hold Jesus because he could find nothing in him. And Jesus came triumphing out of that place, victorious in every way. But here's the great thing, church. There was a legal transaction that happened between him and the devil, and it went like this. I took their consequences. And that means this, that sin no longer separates you from God. This means that you no longer have to live under bondage, torment, and you no longer have to be just this, keep me safe from all this terrible stuff around me. I want you to hear this, church, because it's so important. It affects everything we do. Now, you can choose to believe that or not. If you don't believe it, you still get, the devil still messes with you. But I promise you this. If you stand up in Jesus, sub accepting the work he did on the cross, and you stand up in that, the devil must run for you, run from you faster than you can even see him. That means you are not under siege from the devil. That means that no matter what is happening around you, you can be victorious. That means that the rejection of your neighbor when you share Jesus with him has no power over your soul. That means that you don't have to spend all your time thinking about how you're going to just make it through the day. Church, this is so important. This means that you can take your mind away from self-preservation. And you can put it on the eternal things, the valuable things, the glorious things of this life. No longer does your biggest concern have to be, will I have enough money for the month? No longer does your biggest concern have to be, will my children serve the Lord? No longer does your biggest concern have to be, will I be good enough at my job? Now you are free to have your biggest concern be, 
How can the glory of what Jesus did be seen in all the earth? How can my life reflect that at every moment? How can the world see who Jesus is through me? How can I stand up in this victory that I have and let it be known through all the earth, through all my family, at my workplace, in my society, on the bus? Church, can you tell I believe this? <laughs> and because we are not under siege by the devil, Matthew 28, 20 verse 28 says that he gave himself as a ransom for many. Just to make sure that what I'm saying is biblical. That means that all good things are possible. Church, that's what it means. It means that we no longer have to think, what if something bad happens? I want, I want to invite you to start saying this. Oh, my word, what if something good happens? How am I going to cope? How am I going to cope if all my neighbors get saved? How am I going to cope if I get a raise every month? How am I going to cope if all my children serve you and just want to go as missionaries to all the nations? <sighs> Come on. Come on, what could God do? And that means, logically, from those two points, that taking risks in following Jesus always ends well. That means you're already safe in Jesus. It means you're already successful in him. And it means you can take risks. You can step out of your comfort zone. You can do something you haven't done before. You can reach out to someone. You can make yourself vulnerable. You can love like you've never loved before. You can um, work hard and, and put yourself into your work. You can, you can love people around you. You can stand up for righteousness and truth when it's not popular. You can do these things. Why? Because the cross has won it all. This means you no longer have to be ashamed. You no longer have to be afraid. You no longer have to think of yourself as a small cog in a huge machine. You can now think of yourself as the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Church, is this making you happy? Because I'm going to have to say it all over again if, you don't, if it isn't. Isaiah 66 verse 8 says this, Who has ever heard of such a thing? Who has ever seen such a thing? Can a country be born in a day or a nation be brought forth in a moment? Yet no sooner is Zion in labor than she gives birth to her children. What is God saying? God's saying, all your labor, all your effort, I am coming to answer that by fire. I am coming to answer your prayers, your um, heart, your persistence in righteousness with a breakthrough that is going to be so sudden that people will stand in awe. And I don't know how you felt about Friday night, but I felt that this scripture was being manifested at that moment. But here's an interesting thing Bill Heibel said that I just love. He says, no one, nobody comes to Christ unless somebody takes a risk. Someone took a risk on you. Someone reached out to you. Your life is different because someone took a chance. Someone risked being embarrassed. Someone risked being vulnerable. Someone risked not knowing what to say or not having all the answers. Reached out to you, grabbed you, spoke to you, loved you, walked with you, invited you. And church, I want you to feel this in your heart. There is a victory God wants to bring on this. You know what they are? I, I'm going to be real with you for a moment. I hear running around the church world so many ideas of the end times that are so destructive. So destructive. They speak about how things are going to be so bad that you're going to have to be zapped out of here, that the, the church will be removed from the world, and that there will be no witness of Jesus. Guys, it's rubbish. The Bible does not say that. The Bible says of the increase of his government and peace, there is no end. And if this is messing with your end time theology, come back next week and hear it again and again and again until we can work this thing out. 
Because let me tell you, that is not what God promises. That's not what the victory of Jesus did. The victory of Jesus is this. His resurrection is a promise to you. It's a promise to you that God is coming back for this world and he's bringing every Christian with him and he is going to rule and reign on this world. That he's not just interested in you, he's interested in South Africa. He's interested in the nations. He's interested in the infrastructure. He's interested in government. He wants a world serving him and he is going to do it. Are you all happy? Some of you are thinking, oh my word, where does this woman come from? <laughs> I came right from Randburg. <laughs> but church, it is so important. It is so important because it will affect everything. Listen to me carefully. We have to get out of this lager mentality. We have to get out of this, we're this poor persecuted church. And even if we are persecuted, who cares? The message we carry is going to take over the world. We have to believe this. It's, imper it's imperative for the sake of your children. Don't hand them a, an insipid, fallen gospel. Really, live your lives as a demonstration of what God has done. And guys, that I see some of you looking like, I, I'm, I, I'm not so important. She must be talking to the other important people in this room because I don't think that my life counts for that much. No, guys, I know, I know, I see it. Listen, it's literally written over some of your heads. I'm, I'm, she's talking to the other people because I'm not really meant to change the world. I just need to make it through tomorrow. <laughs> I'm going to ask you to raise your hands if you thought that. <laughs> I know, I can see it, guys. It's not true. It's not true. The devil wants you to stay in that place, and it's not true. Amen. Amen. I want to stay on this point for a lot, lot longer. I have, I have other points which I'm going to ignore, but I think it's so important. I think it's so important. Guys, who you think you are and what you think Jesus did will change everything. Listen to me. Listen to me. You are free. No, really. You're free. You don't have to live under the bondage of sin. You don't have to live under the tyranny of fear. Listen to me. You don't have to do it. And you think, oh my word, these things are so real. You don't know what's going on in my life. Guys, if I could list what I have come through, you would, you would be crying and you'd be, I don't know, you'd be offering me vodka. I don't know what you'd be doing. But... <laughs> But you name it, I've been through it. Andrew and I have lost everything a number of times. We face sickness, hardship, persecution. There have been times when I have hung on to this truth just by my fingernails. So I'm here to tell you, I... If I could beg you, I would. If I could beg you, I would. Because I want to tell you, the alternative of believing this is living a mediocre, non-existent, not non-existent, a mediocre life that doesn't accomplish your dreams. This is the key to seeing your dreams fulfilled. Have you got it? <laughs> if you'd got it, you would have said it better than that. <laughs> Church, my, if, I, if I could say it again, the cross is a complete victory. And you live in that victory. Everybody knows about playing with dominoes. But what you may not know is that a domino can knock over another domino, which is about one and a half times larger. So what I have here is a chain of dominoes. Each one is one and a half times larger than the previous one. And the smallest domino is about five millimeters high and one millimeter thick. And I will carefully place it. And there are 13 dominoes. And the largest domino, it weighs about 100 pounds and is more than a meter tall. Ready? Boom. 
that was 13 dominoes. If I had 29 dominoes, the last domino would be as tall as the Empire State Building. How, how do you change a nation? How do you change a nation? How do you change a nation? <laughs> Just like the world was changed by Paul. Ananias, perhaps he thought of himself as that tiny little domino, but he was obedient and he went to his just one and he knocked over that just one. Paul went and knocked over his Titus. Titus went and knocked over his, I don't know, Jonathan. He went and knocked over his, I don't know what Greek names are, but they just knocked over and they knocked over and they knocked over and they knocked over and the whole world bowed its knees to Jesus Christ. Paul wasn't a likely candidate, but God and man working together made a disciple and it resulted in exponential growth. Exponential growth. That's how this movement in, in Johannesburg started. Those are the first members of what is now Every Nation Joburg. Bill Bennett, <laughs> Bill Bennett and his wife Connie, Sheila, and right on the right there is Andrew Gosman. Yeah, I know. It's amazing, hey? <laughs> now you know why I married him. <laughs> now you know why I married him. And today, there are 3,000 people serving the Lord in every nation, Johannesburg. The domino effect of just one. I am here to tell you that if you take hold of your neighbor... You speak about what God has done in your life. You take arms with them. You walk with them. You invite them to church. You teach them how to read their Bible. You pray with them. You get them into connect group. You uh, get them serving in church. You get them to ignition. You get them to victory training. You get them to equip training. You get them to making disciples. And after a year, they are as in fire about Jesus as you are. And the two of you then go out and find one more person. And you do the same for the next year. Bam, bam, bam. After 10 years, we will have 1,024 people just from you. After 20 years, we will have a church filled of on-fire Jesus disciples that is bigger than the population of Johannesburg. After 26 years, we will have reached the whole of South Africa, and it just started with you, just one. Here's the, the wild thing. After 33 years, we would have over 8 billion people radically serving God. That's bigger than the world population. I don't know if it'll be bigger than the world population in 33 years, but it's certainly big. Amen. I'm going to stop there. I think that's a good place to stop. Just one. This is what we're asking you to do, to step out of your comfort zone, to reach out to someone, to take a risk, to start a relationship, invite them, share your story, and then keep walking with them until they are able to do what you did with them. Amen. Lord, we thank you for your goodness and your grace amongst us, Lord God. We thank you that you indeed are the good God that you say you are. We thank you indeed that your, your cross won it all, Lord God, that your victory is complete, that Jesus is who he says he is, that we are who you say we are, Lord God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. And Lord God, I want to... I want to ask that you would help us to make a commitment to reach our one. Right now, where you are, I'm going to ask you that you think about who could be that one person. You know, you might have to reach out to 5, 10, 15 people before you find that one that clicks. But I want you to start thinking about that. Can you do that right there with your eyes closed? I want you to ask God, who can I make a phone call to? Who can I send a WhatsApp to? Who can I invite out a coffee? Who can I share my testimony with? Who can I pray with? Who can I reach out to? I want you to start thinking of those people. And I'm going to ask you to make a commitment between you and God. 
that you will reach these people, that you will reach out to these people in the next week. You would send that message, you would make that phone call, and you will see what comes of that. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. And with every head bowed, Lord, I just want to ask, Father God, as I, as I preach that, the gospel of the cross, Lord God, there were some people here that they realized that they had not understood that. And they have been living just trying to be good people. They didn't know that as they submit to Jesus, he gave them freedom and righteousness as a gift. And there are people here that have not grasped that. And Lord God, I want to ask that right now you would speak to their hearts, that they would know that. And if you are here, and this, this has come as a revelation to you, this has come as a new understanding that you are indeed free in Jesus. And you, you want that freedom. You, you want that liberty. You want to step out of your old way of living into a way of living where Jesus is paramount, where Jesus is in charge, where Jesus is Lord where your life is submitted to Him. If you would like to do that, I'm going to ask you to raise your hand because I would like to pray with you. Is there anyone who would like to do that? Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Lord, I want to pray that you would give every member of our church success in reaching out to their neighbors, reaching out to their friends, reaching out to their colleagues. Lord, thank you that you are, you are so able to do this. Lord God, give us compassion for those people around us that haven't experienced the joy of knowing you and give us the courage to do what it takes to bring them to you. Thank you, Lord. Amen and amen.